hello. I'm probably looking particularly eccentric today, <laughs> but it's um, it's a very cold day, and uh, there was actually some sleet this morning. Oh, hello. I don't know if you actually want to see my mouth, but there it is. <laughs> um, so this is um, something I do every year. I've come to Norfolk Hill Reserve uh, outside of Cooling um, on the Hu Peninsula and um, I come here every year in the winter, often several times, um, to see the rook roost. So every year there's about, I think it's about 4,000 um, rooks and crows that roost in the woods here at Norfolk Hill. Um, and yeah, it can be quite spectacular, but it's a bit hit and miss. So the other year I seemed to bring um, various men out here um, to see it, saying, oh, it's marvellous and, you know, you're going to get a fantastic um, sight and it's a big spectacle in nature. And I think only once did we see anything. So it is quite hit and miss, but I've come out here on a very cold and rather beautiful afternoon in the hope that we'll get to see the rook roost. Um, so I can hear them tuning up. They're always around here, the rooks. They're a real feature, I think. The rooks and the jackdaws were a real feature of the Hoo Peninsula. If you go into Cooling, where there's the big Cooling Castle, um, then they're always sitting on the turrets and things there. And when I lived out here, so this is where I lived in my caravan, anyone who's read the book on the marshes, um, this is where my caravan used to be. So this in some ways is my backyard, which is probably why I presume it's a bit unusual for a woman to feel quite happy walking around in the countryside at night. Um, and obviously the sun's probably, yes, sun's going down behind me. Um, so I'm probably in shadow. But um, yeah, this, this, I'm very lucky to say, used to be my back garden when I lived in the caravan. So I always feel quite confident walking around here um, even in the dark really because frankly who else is going to be doing it other than me So this is the cherry orchard at Northwood Hill and actually there's a sign on the gate now. There's a sign on the gate telling you that you shouldn't come in here, um, which is probably fair enough to be honest because the trees are very old and people in the last few years have taken to um, really climbing up into the trees. They've got beautiful crop of cherries here I have to say, but they are all splitting and breaking so actually I don't blame them for retiring it as they say. Um, clearly I'm not following this rule um, but I've come down here because hopefully they'll do something with my bench. So this bench I commissioned um, when I worked here. And frankly this bench cost a lot of money. So look at it, it's beautiful. It's made by Andrew Lapthorn. He's a local um, joiner. I, I think that's probably what he's called but this bench is look. I do hope the RSPB will do something with my beautiful bench because I have to say this has been my confessional bench over the last few years. I've had quite a few big conversations with people where they've told me big secrets in their life on this bench. So, so I'm afraid RSPB, today I'm confessing that I have broken into your cherry orchard to sit on my bench. Um, I... I have a real thing about this cherry orchard. This is one of my song lines. Um, so I've come here lots of times um, and sort of walked a route around the orchard and I don't know, it's like some talisman, it's good luck or something. Or maybe it's just revisiting parts of your life. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, yeah, I have, I really love this cherry orchard. And I camped here when I did my um, walk for my book on the marshes, then I camped here 
um, on the first night of the walk with my friend. Um, and um, we used to do art events here and it used to look beautiful I have to say we have a little candlelit path coming down here and we used to have a bar that would turn up um, once a year in the orchard um, we'd have a bar down here and all the local people would come some of them I have to say would get quite plastered um, and my uh, ex who's called Connor in the book used to act as a barman um, and so they were good times I had some lovely times in this cherry orchard and also I met some really interesting people and they told me that how the local village children particularly girls um, used to be picked um, and they'd have to prove that they could run up the ladders um, really fast and get between all the branches in order to pick the cherries and if they could prove how quickly and agilely they could get up the uh, cherry orchard ladders then they would get a day's work and I met a lovely woman in the local village I remember who told me how she got picked um, to pick the cherries for the day uh, and I think they were quite young the kids when they used to do it I think they were like sort of five or six because obviously they were kind of little skinny nimble kids um, and there wasn't much health and safety so they'd climb up these big standard cherry trees and and pick the cherries um, and there's four different types of cherry in here uh, there's something that's known as black naps and there's a red a black cherry and a white cherry um, and then one that comes on really early so it is beautiful cherry orchard about the RSPB tell me it's dangerous so I better get out of here before someone catches me Okay, so we're now we're heading out towards where the rook roost um, normally is. Um, <clears throat> so you can see how flat it is out here. Oh, I walk this way sideways. It's not impossible. Um, you can see that it's this really flat landscape, and it's so flat that sometimes it almost appears that the boats are sort of sailing across the land because from here you can't really see that the Thames is out there at all, and you can see straight across to Essex. Um, <clears throat> So this area in the past, I wouldn't have been walking across here, it would have been underwater. Um, and so we'll have a bit of a history lesson. Uh, so, the Thames used to flood regularly back and forth across this land and it would have been all sort of salt marsh and really marshy ground up until the 12th century. And then the monks built a sea wall. Um, which stopped the tides and meant that they could cultivate this land. But unfortunately what the monks left behind were these big pools of sort of stagnant water out here. Um, and it was really difficult to, to cross it. Um, so, oh, I can see the farmer coming, I think I'm most strange. Um, so they left these big pools of stagnant water behind and then in these pools of stagnant water bred this mosquito, the anopheline mosquito and this carried a form of malaria which was known as the ague, I think it's pronounced, or the ague um, and this was like a uh, uh, kind of swept through the local population and so anyone who could afford to move from this area didn't live here because it killed off large sections of the population and in um, Cooling Churchyard there's a little grave known as Pip's Graves after um, it's thought to be where Charles Dickens set the opening pages of Great Expectations so it's known as Pip's Graves but it's actually the grave of the Comport family children and it's very sad because they've got a major headstone and then they've got 12 little lozenge graves they're known all around um, the main headstone and these are 12 children of the Comport family who I believe died in the same year from the uh, marsh fever, the ague um, so the pools of stagnant water there's birds popping out all around me as I'm talking there's pools of stagnant water um, were really bad news hello farmer um, and then they didn't actually start draining them and getting rid of the mosquito I think until the 1970s they had a spraying program out here to get rid of them um, 
and then finally they tackled the mosquito in the 1970s but I have to say from living out here they have the biggest mosquitoes ever uh, breeding out here um, but they tell me they're not mal malaria ones these days so I think we're quite safe and it's looking quite dry now So I don't know how much you're going to be able to see to me in the dark now um, but we're out here now at the Heron viewing point um, and if we're going to see the rooks anywhere this is where they're going to come in but there's no guarantees. So it's getting a bit late now and I don't think they're going to come in today, I don't know where they are. There's still some light left in the sky um, but although I appreciate this is not the normal thing for a woman to be doing. <laughs> I probably should be doing something, I don't know, far more womanly than this, whatever that might be, but I quite love standing out here in the dark and the wildlife doesn't know I'm here and it's just once that plane's gone over this real lovely hush about the place and the occasional heron going over, or some woodcock, or a tall meow calling in the woods, and I think this is a deep privilege to be able to stand out here and the wildlife to be unaware that I'm here and to see it just sort of tucking itself down for the evening into the woods. And also I have to say I think it's a deep privilege that I feel confident enough to be able to do this because I appreciate lots of people probably don't whether that makes me foolish but you know I don't think it does <laughs> because I'm out here enjoying the silence and the birds and I don't know what I'm meant to be doing oh there was another woodcock gone over but I'd rather be here I think so today's walk starts outside the village of Higher Halstow and then we go to Bromhay Farm, where I used to live. And this is the RSPB Reserve. And from there, you follow, this is the Saxon Shore Way. You follow the Saxon Shore Way, but you cut round the back of the wood at Norfolk Hill. And then the place to see the rook roost is about here. <laughs> 